In this video, we're going to learn about how using truth tables to evaluate single propositions would be useful. We'll also learn what is a tautology, a contradiction, a contingent truth, and a contingent proposition. A tautology is a proposition that is always true based on its logical structure. Looking at our truth tables, it will be true no matter what combination of truth values you assign to the simple propositions that make it up. In other words, it's gonna be true on every single row. You might think that sounds good, like, oh, that's something that you want, it's true every single time. Uh, and it is, it's not bad, right? But the it ends up that tautologies tend to be uninformative, like they're true just all the time, so it's sort of like, it's not telling you anything new to find out that something like that is true. So for example, if I'm the logic teacher, then I'm the logic teacher. You could substitute anything you want for I'm the logic teacher, and that statement is gonna come out true just purely based on the structure. I could say, if I'm the philosopher, then I'm the philosopher. If I'm the surfer, then I'm the surfer. No matter what it is, you substitute in in those two different spots, that statement purely based on its structure is gonna come out true. And in just a second here, we'll talk about what that looks like in the truth tables. A contradiction, on the other hand, is always false based on its logical structures. So for example, if I were to say something like, I am the philosophy teacher, if and only if I am not the philosophy teacher, you know, those two things can't go together ever. So purely based on the structure there, that's gonna be false. Or if I said, you know, this is a surfboard, if and only if it's not a surfboard, you could you substitute whatever you want to in those two places and you're going to get a false uh, a result, that bike, that bike initial is gonna be false. Here's an example of a tautology using our truth tables. So P or not P, that's just always going to be true. It's sort of built into our system, the law of excluded middle, that this is gonna come out true no matter what, purely based on its structure. So you assign the truth values to the simple propositions in this compound proposition that we have here. You have to negate that second P, and then the disjunction is true only when at least one disjunct is true, and in this case, you have both of these things coming out true. No matter what we do, whether we say that P is true or P is false, this is gonna be a true proposition. That is a tautology. Here's an example of a contradiction. P and not P. Now just intuitively that makes sense. To say that P is true and also to say that P is false, that can't happen, right? So again, we assign our truth values to the simple propositions. We negate that second proposition there. And then the conjunction is only true when both conjuncts are true, but notice on either row, we have a false conjunct. So this conjunction will never be true. Doesn't matter what P stands for, that proposition based on its logical structure is never gonna come out to be a true proposition. This is a contradiction. By the way, you may look at these two examples that I've given you, very simple examples. You may think, well, yeah, I can see how this is gonna be the case because you only have two options here, but what if you up the ante, right? What if you added more options over there on the left? Now, there's only two options in classical logic for P, right? P's can only be true or false. It has to be one or the other. But what if I added a Q in there? And then all of a sudden, as we've seen in videos before this, you have four different uh, possible combinations of truth values. Is that gonna hurt things here? No, no matter what, in this proposition, the only simple proposition that goes into making it up is that P, and P, again, can only be true or false. So it doesn't matter what we add over there on the key. Because of the fact of this logical structure of, of this proposition here, it's always gonna be false. It'll always be a contradiction. A couple of extra names here. Instead of tautology, you could call this a logical truth because it's true, you know, just purely based on logical reasons all the time. For the contradiction, you could call that a logical falsehood because with every row, you're gonna get a false in this proposition. You could also call it unsatisfiable because no matter what we put in to those different Ps, whatever matter what truth value we assign to those, it's always gonna turn out false. You can't satisfy this proposition, you know? Now you may think about that and think, oh, well, if this is unsatisfiable, then that would mean the tautology is the satisfiable one. Well, yes and no. Not every proposition is gonna be either a tautology or a contradiction, right? There are some propositions that could be true given some arrangement of truth values for those simple propositions or could be false. Those propositions won't be tautologies, but they won't be contradictions either. They will be considered satisfiable because they do have some possible rows where they could be true. And in our book, we see that Smith has given us a, a little diagram there to show us the different possibilities. And what's nice about this diagram here is it also shows how uh, satisfiable and non-tautology sort of overlay this diagram. So 
for those propositions that aren't all false. It would include tautologies, and it would also include any proposition that has at least one row where the proposition comes out true. Whereas a non-tautology would include contradictions or just any proposition that has at least one row that comes out false. In the book, they actually also mention this term non-logical truth that could be substituted in there for non-tautology. And I don't know, you should read the endnotes for sure, because the endnotes are always giving you helpful information in this book. But notice how that there's no space in that logical truth. Non-logical truth means that it's not a tautology, a logical truth, right? When we use that term logical truth to mean tautology, it's not one of those guys. So is there a term that could cover those propositions that sort of go in the middle there, that have some rows where the proposition comes out true, some rows where it comes out false? Well, they do have this one term, contingent proposition. And just so we're clear, here's an example of a contingent proposition. P or Q. So you fill out the truth values of the simple propositions and the disjunction is true whenever at least one disjunct is true. And notice at the bottom there, they're both false. So the whole disjunction is false. So it has three rows of true and one row of false. That's a contingent proposition. Now you may wonder why didn't Smith include in this diagram here the term contingent proposition? It's because there's this other way of using the word contingent that might be a little bit confusing. A lot of times when we say Contingent, we mean a contingent truth or a contingent falsehood, different from a contingent proposition. A contingent truth is a contingent proposition that also in actual reality is true. So when we look at our P or Q here, we don't know exactly which row we're on until we actually fill things out and then look at the real world and say, you know, what is, which row are we on? So for example, if P stood for, I don't know, um, the surfboard is white, and if Q stood for, this surfboard is black. Now, P is true there, and Q is false there, so when I look at my little uh, table here, I see that I'm on the second row. P is T, and Q is F. And when I look at that row, I see, ah, this is a true disjunction. But if I'm just looking at it logically, if I'm not looking at anything else but the structure here, I wouldn't be sure which row I was on, without filling those things out and then actually looking at the surfboards there. So we call this a contingent truth because it's true, but it could have been false, right? There is a row here where it could turn out false. A contingent falsehood would be something like uh, same P or Q, but if I said uh, either this surfboard is black or this surfboard is black. Now both of those propositions, P and Q there, are false, so we're on the fourth row. This proposition has come out false, However, it could have come out true based on its logical structure. So the difference between a contingent proposition and a contingent truth or a falsehood is the contingent truth and falsehood makes reference to reality, makes reference to what this sentence actually means and you know what P and Q actually stand for, and then goes around and looks and says, okay, which row are we on here? Is P true or is it false? Is Q true or is it false? Whereas when we're looking at it as just a con contingent proposition, we're looking at it and say, okay, what are our different possibilities? And we're not saying, okay, we're on this possibility. That was a whole lot of explanation for contingency. I, hopefully that wasn't too much. Um, but let's get into our exercise 4.2.1, looking at problem number one. Number one, if P or Q, then P. Now we'll fill this out in just a second here, but first let's try to make sense out of this. The P or Q is made true Sure, if P is true, right, then P or Q is made true. And then that second P would be true too. Great. But that P or Q could also be made true if Q is true, but P is false. So let's imagine that happens. Q is true and P is false, then that whole disjunction is going to be true, but the P and the consequent is going to be false. So we'll have a true antecedent, false consequent. This is going to be false proposition in that case. So. This should be a contingent proposition. It should be true in some rows, but false in other rows. So first step, fill out the truth values of our simple propositions. Then we need to build that disjunction. It's true when either disjunct, possibly both are true, and it's only false when both disjuncts are false. And finally, we'll have to build up that conditional. And it's only false when we have a true antecedent and a false consequent. And it looks like that happens in row three, but for all the other rows, it looks like we're good. Number two says, both the case that not P, and it's also the case that either Q or R. Now, these two disjuncts aren't really related, so I don't think we're actually gonna get 
uh, I think this is probably gonna be just a contingent proposition. We'll go ahead and fill out our simple propositions and then we're gonna have to negate that P. Remember that's just flipping T's and F's. And then we'll have to build up the disjunction. Remember true if either disjunct, possibly both are true, only false when both disjuncts are false. And finally, we'll have to build up that conjunction. Conjunction is uh, only true when both conjuncts are true. Otherwise, it's going to be false. So it looks like this is a true statement when P is false and Q is true, P is false and R is true, P is false and Q and R are true. Otherwise, it's a false proposition. Number three says, not P or Q, if and only if, both P and not Q. Now notice how in this biconditional, biconditional is true if both propositions that make it up are true, or if both of them are false. So in this one, we'll be wanting to see, are both of them true at the same time on the same row, or are both of them false on the same row? Either way, we'll get a true biconditional. But when I look at that P and not Q, the P and the not Q are both contradictories of what's in the disjunction and at the beginning of that biconditional, not P and Q, right? So if P and not Q is true, that's gonna make both not P and Q false it's in the disjunction. So the disjunction won't be true when the conjunction is true. Whereas if you flip it around and say, you know, could these both be false at the same time? Well, anything that would make P and not Q false would show up in that disjunction and that would make the disjunction true. So yeah, I don't think, I think what we're gonna get here is a contradiction. So let's fill out the simple propositions here, P, Q, and then we'll build that not P by flipping the T's and F's, build that not Q by flipping the T's and F's. Let's build the disjunction. Remember the disjunction is true when either disjunct, possibly both are true, false only when both disjuncts are false. Then build the conjunction. Conjunction is only true when both conjuncts are true, otherwise it's false. And then to see whether this biconditional is true or not, I look down here and I see, are there any rows where we have T's, you know, two T's together or two F's together? No, it looks like they're all false, so this is a contradiction. Number four, if P then, if Q then, if R then P. That one is definitely uh, pretty confusing, but this one is gonna be a tautology because it starts with that P and it ends with that P. So when I, I that may not be intuitive right off the bat, but when you think about that P, th that first, that big conditional is only gonna be false when P is true and the consequent in there, that if Q, then if R, then if, you know, if that whole thing is false. So when P is true though, uh, to make Q, if Q, then if R, then P false, Q would have to be true and if R then P would have to be false. Then to make if R then P false, we would have to be, have R to be true and P to be false. But then again, this one particular you know episode we're thinking about where that for, that antecedent P is true is the only way to make this whole thing fa uh, false. Well, in that case, this the second P in, in, in the end of that last consequent would also be true. So you're gonna have a P true at the beginning and a P true at the end. You have no way to have that conditional, have a, a T and then an F at the very end. So if there's no way for this thing to be false. So this is gonna to have to be a tautology. Fill out the simple proposition, truth values. And, but then first we need to do that inner conditional if R then P. Remember, conditional only false when the antecedent is true, R, and the consequent is false, P here. And then we have all those values. We then build up the next conditional, and then again, only false when the antecedent Q here is true and the consequent is false, otherwise it's gonna be true. And finally, same thing here with the big conditional. We have only false when P is true and then the uh, consequent is false, but when I, I fill out all the different possibilities here, I see that I'll never have that case, so this is going to be uh, a tautology. Number five, if P then, if P the Q, then Q. That sounds, I know, pretty dramatic, but um, let's think about this. In the antecedent for the, the big conditional, it says, you know, pretend P is true. And then the antecedent for that next conditional, if P then Q, right? It says, so assume that if you have P, then you're gonna have Q, right? And that's the first thing we said in that antecedent, that the big antecedent is that, that, you know, pretend we had P. So if you have P and you also have it be the case that if P the Q, you're gonna have Q. So that sounds like this is gonna be a tautology. So let's fill out the P's and the Q's here. 
First, we're gonna have to build that middle conditional, that's the innermost conditional. And it's only false when I have a, a true antecedent and a false consequent that happens in row two. And so that's the only false one, everything else is true. Then we'll have to build up that uh, if P then Q then Q conditional, that one. And again, only false when we have true antecedent and false consequent. Looks like that's gonna happen in row four. And then we have the uh, the biggest conditional over there. Again, only false when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. The P is only true in the top two rows, but in those top two rows, we have a true value for the, the consequent there. So looks like this one is always gonna be true. Five is always, the five is a tautology. Six, not the same story. Like, so here's what it says. If P then, if Q then P, then Q. So again, very similar to the one we had before this, but this is what this one says. Pretend you have P. Now in that inner conditional, pretend that if you had Q, then you would have P. Well, does that prove, let's say we have P then, and we have this rule, if Q then P. Does that prove that I have Q? Well, I could have got P some other way, right? Sure, if I had Q, then I would have P. But just because I have P doesn't prove that, that I got there by having Q. So then at the end of this, where it says, therefore Q, or then Q, right? Well, that's not necessarily the case. So it looks like this is gonna be, I mean, that's definitely possible. That's definitely one way, but that doesn't have to be the only way. It looks like this is going to be a contingent proposition. So let's fill out the P's and Q's, the truth values for those guys. We're gonna have to build, again, that middle conditional there. Only false when antecedent is true, consequent is false. And it looks like Q is true and P is false in the third row. And then I have to build up the, uh, the last part right there of the conditional, if Q then P then Q. And again, only false when I have uh, if, if Q then P true and Q false. And it looks like that happens on rows two and four. And then I have to build up that last one, if P then, if Q then P then Q. And again, I'm looking for any true antecedent and a false consequent. P is true on the first two rows and the consequent is false on the second row. So it looks like the rest of them are true. We have some trues and some falses. It looks like we're gonna have a contingent proposition here. Number seven, if P then Q or not Q and not Q. That second part of this disjunction that says, it's not the case that you have both Q and not Q. Well, notice that Q and not Q is a contradiction. So denying that, it would always be true. It would be a tautology, right? So that part of the disjunction is a tautology. And it looks like every time that's true, it's gonna make this whole disjunction true, right? Because disjunction is true when at least one disjunct is true. But if that second disjunct is always true, then this disjunction is always gonna be true. So notice one interesting thing. When you have a disjunction and you know one disjunct is true, you can throw whatever you want to in that second part of the disjunction. So if I have this, you know, not Q and not Q, I could say, or, and then throw, uh, I don't know, Z in there. And whatever Z would be doesn't really matter. This disjunction is gonna be made true by that uh, tautology in that disjunct. So let's divvy out the T's and F's for P's and Q's. And first let's build that if P then Q, and remember, only false when we have a true antecedent false consequent that happens in row two, otherwise it's true. Then we'll uh, look at the, that second disjunct and we'll have to negate that Q first, just flipping T's and F's. And then it says Q and not Q. That notices the contradiction there. And so the, the conjunction there is only true when both conjuncts are true, but it's never the case that both conjuncts are true. So this is all totally false but then we're negating this. So we're gonna flip all those Fs to Ts, and then we're gonna look at the disjunction. True when at least one disjunct is true, and that second disjunct is always true. So this is a tautology. Number eight, if P then Q, or it's not the case that Q and not P. What's interesting here is that it's not the case that both Q and not P. When I look at that one, uh, that is made, that negation, means that you either have Q false or not P false, right? So in other words, either not Q or P, either Q is false or P is true. 
So when I look at that if P, the Q, the, uh, the other side of the disjunction, the only thing that would make that false is when we have uh, P being true and Q being false. Basically, you know, the option that we had there in that second part of the disjunction. So it looks like, now, so that, that may sound like, oh, then do we have a contradiction here? Well, not quite, because remember, this whole thing is a disjunction, right? So what we want is at least one disjunct to be true, but if that second disjunct is gonna cover the, the case when if P then Q is false, then it looks like that we're gonna have at least one disjunct true in every single row, but let's check that out. So let's fill out all of our different P's and Q's here, and then we're gonna have to build that, first that conditional in the first disjunct. Remember, only false when we have true antecedent, false consequent, that's row two, otherwise it's all true. Then looking at the second disjunct, we're gonna have to negate that uh, P there first, just flipping Fs and Ts, and then build the conjunction. Remember, only true when both conjuncts are true, otherwise false. So it looks like that's only true in row three, but then we're negating that. So we're gonna get a bunch of Ts and just that one F in row three. And finally, we're putting these two in a disjunction, and it looks like, remember disjunction's true when either disjunct, possibly both are true. And it looks like on each row, we have at least one true disjunct. So this disjunction is always gonna be true. This is a tautology. Problem number nine, P and Q, if and only if, Q, if and only if P. So this is an interesting one. The uh, if and only if, that biconditional in the middle there is true when both of those propositions on either side of it are both true or both of them are both false. So the question here is, does P and Q ever diverge from Q if and only if P? And when I look at those two, remember P and Q is always true if both conjuncts are true. If it's ever the case that both conjuncts are false, then it's false. The biconditional Q if and only if P is always true Again, when Q and P are both true, just like for that P and Q, but it's also true when Q and P are both false. So it looks like we're gonna have some cases where these two match up and some cases where they don't. So I think this is going to be a contingent proposition. So fill out our P's and Q's here. The P and Q for the uh, first part of that biconditional, that conjunction, only true in row one where we have both conjuncts true, otherwise it's all false. The Q if and only if P part of the biconditional, that is true when Q and P are both true, row one, and it's also true when Q and P are both false, otherwise it's false, so rows two and three. So it looks like for that biconditional, looks like they're both true in, uh, in row one, so that's true for the biconditional. They're both false in row two, so that's true. Both false in row three, true, but that conjunction is false and the biconditional is true in row four, so the big biconditional will be false in that row, contingent proposition. And finally, problem number 10. It's not the case that if P and Q, then Q if and only if P. This one is gonna be a complicated one, so Let's see, just eyeballing it. That P and Q, remember, that the antecedent is only true when both of those guys are true. So only, it looks like only in row one where P and Q are both gonna be true. That's the only time that we're gonna have to worry about is this conditional false? And when we, we have that Q, if and only if P, that's true. That's gonna be true when Q and P are both true. So it looks like the only case where we're gonna have a true antecedent it, for this conditional, we're also gonna have a true consequent. So it looks like this conditional is always gonna be true. But that means negating this conditional is gonna make it always false. In other words, this is gonna be a contradiction. So let's fill out our P's and Q's. And again, we'll build that con conjunction first. And it's only true in row one where we have both conjuncts true, otherwise it's false. Q if and only if P, is true when both Q and P are true or when both Q and P are false, otherwise it's false. And then looking at that conditional, only false when we have true antecedent, false consequent. Again, uh, uh, row one is the only time when we have a true antecedent, but we also have a true consequent. So this is always true, this conditional is always true. And then negating that is gonna be false every single time. So we're gonna have 
a, a contradiction. For next time, please read 4.3 and also do exercises for 4.3.1. We're gonna use this same kind of technique and we're gonna see whether two different propositions meld together or whether they contradict each other, or whether they're always agreeing, those kinds of things. So similar to this, but just a little bit different. And I'll see you in that video.